if you're here, I assume you're gonna, you, you wanna hear about the, uh, the large scale migrations from on-premise to, to Azure. Uh, my name is Shane Risk. I'm a senior program manager with the uh, Azure SQL Data Warehouse team now, Azure Synapse, and my co-speaker. Yeah. Yeah, hi, I'm Elizabeth Oldag, uh, Senior Program Manager on the Azure Data Lake Storage team. Okay. Obligatory cell phone slide. Um, yeah, I'm, it, I'll turn mine off too, just in case. All right, here we go. Uh, I just introduced myself, but it's a little more background. I am a uh, Senior Program Manager with the, the Azure Synapse Analytics team. I'm sure you've heard some details about that if you're in this room. Uh, we'll spend a little bit of time on that today in the context of the large-scale migrations. Um, prior to joining this team, I've spent a number of years as a consultant in different roles, just working with customers in the BI and data warehousing space. And uh, it's been a pretty exciting journey so far. Um, Elizabeth, mm -hmm. you can... Um, yeah. Yeah, so I've been on the uh, Microsoft's big data storage team for over six years, and it includes uh, running and operating our own internal data lake storage platform, and also the data lake storage Gen 1, and now the, the data lake storage Gen 2 platform. And to give you a little bit more background, I started out, and my um, education is in physics, and I used big data to do my research, uh, which was in experimental nuclear physics, where we had to collect terabytes of data and use, but that was big data back then, <laughs> tens of terabytes of data, and use uh, big computing clusters to actually get the um, analysis out of that data. And um, it was a nice segue into becoming uh, a, a program manager on the platform side, uh, since I already had used one as a customer. So um, that's a little background. Okay. The specific agenda we're going to talk about, we're going to start with some of the migration challenges you, you'll run into when you're trying to move um, uh, large amounts of data to the cloud. Specifically, we're going to be talking more about the enterprise data warehouse space, since that's the team I'm from, and um, how Azure Data Lake kind of enables that functionality. And we'll get into more of those details here. So we're going to start with some of the challenges talk uh, a little bit about what that architecture looks like, the, the modern data warehouse, and how things have sort of changed over time, how the Azure platform can help meet the needs required uh, in the, the current landscape of data. And then we'll talk a little bit about some customer journeys. Uh, the team I'm on currently, we, do, we help customers with their migrations. And so we've got some stories from that that we'll walk through some of the lessons learned and that sort of thing. Before we get into that, let's do a quick quiz. I'm sure this is the, uh, the first quiz you guys have had all week. Uh, kidding. Um, if you're paying attention to Rohan's uh, keynote earlier this week, one of the things he mentioned was the estimated amount of data uh, by 2020. This is worldwide. Anyone remember? <laughs> so we have uh, 44 edibytes, 440. Exabytes, sorry. 44 zettabytes or 4,400 zettabytes? It was 44 zettabytes. Yeah, which is an uh, unfathomable amount of data from my perspective. That's, that's pretty amazing. Um, just an interesting factoid. So we're, uh, we're going to move on. So just some preamble here. As you are all aware of the big data world, we have this whole volume, variety, velocity thing that we've been talking about for, for years now. And in order to deal with this big data landscape, we've got a, a whole bunch of tools that have come out in the market, everything from Hadoop to have evolved into Spark. We've got the MPP technologies that have, have grown. And uh, as, as that continues to expand, it makes it more and more difficult for us to tame our data, so to speak. Uh, but in order to do that, we have developed a number of tools. Coincidentally, cloud has been coming on just as strong here in the past few years. And there's a, a whole bunch of tools in cloud that will allow us to bring this all in, under, grips, under, under grips so that we can manage our data and get the insights that everybody hungers for. 
the couple of benefits here of the cloud, of course, are you have the, the scale, the adaptability, you can scale up and down, you can um, use the right tool for the job, and that's going to be one of the trends that you see in this talk. Um, we want to be very specific about the right tool for the job, and me coming from the Azure Data Warehouse team, I want to make sure that it, there's a clear understanding of exactly what workloads fit in Data Warehouse, uh, to make sure that uh, if you're going down that path, you're using the right, uh, the right tool. Um, so we're going to talk about unsuitable workloads to make sure that if you do want to use the uh, Azure Data Warehouse MPP platform, you're comfortable with exactly what that means, what the strengths are, and what some of the weaknesses are. We're going to just kind of spend a little bit of time. We won't spend a tremendous amount of time on that. Um, but some of the other challenges, let's, once we pass it out, bar, some of the other challenges that we face when you're tr planning to move like an enterprise data warehouse, and I'm mainly talking specifically about like uh, APS, if you're familiar with that, Natezis, Teradata, some of these very big, large-scale enterprise data warehouses, some of them could have been being built up over the past you know, 20 or 30 years. These are huge implementations, huge amounts of data, and there can be a tremendous amount of technical debt that's accumulated over that time. So just the sheer volume and uh, uh, sort of legacy of these systems that have, have built up makes them very, very complex to move. And so there's different approaches we can take to that. So, um, and we'll focus on those in a bit, but I'll, I'll finish sort of enumerating some of the other challenges here. Uh, other things that we run into, these systems tend to be very political and there's a lot of back and forth between uh, groups internally that can make it very unclear as to what some of the requirements are and how you get from point A to B with all the infighting and different things. Those can be very, those can be very challenging. Um, as IT practitioners, we do the best we can to navigate through that, but that's one of the other challenges you can run into. Um, time and cost, obviously, because these are so large is always a factor, and then um, when you're talking specifically about cloud, I think this is doubly important, value through performance. So you want to make sure that what you're spending is giving you the benefit to the customer. If you're not getting the ROI for what you're spending for the, your projects, then it's going to be hard to justify their continuation. <clears throat> so we'll start with the things that SQL DW, now Azure, I'm, I'm, I'm it's going to take me a while to say Azure Synapse. Uh, workloads that are suitable for Azure Synapse in its current form. I'm not talking about the, the workspace functionality that is coming, specifically what was formerly SQL Data Warehouse. Uh, we're looking at large volumes of data, usually five terabytes minimum. If you're less than that, you could probably run it on one of the other cloud technologies. Um, you know, most of the customers my group works with, you're looking at 10 terabytes plus. The um, disparate data from a single location, yeah, that's pretty common, right? If you're running an enterprise data warehouse, you're going to be pulling data in from a number of sources. The shape, model transformation, aggregations, essentially it boils down to doing analytic workloads. You're looking at large amounts of data uh, in big batches, and you're trying to aggregate across and do trending across those data sets. If you're doing that type of work on relational data that's tightly, usually tightly structured, um, that's exactly where you want to be. Where we don't want to be is trying to run, so a lot of customers will see, oh, SQL Data Warehouse, prior to the rebranding on that, uh, and they think, ah, it's just a massive data warehouse, so I'm going to run my you know, POS um, point of sale system on top of Azure SQL Data Warehouse, and they end up with a mess because it's not built for high volumes of transactions. It's built to scale out huge workloads and crunch through all the information so you can get answers to, um, to your, your business questions. Other things here, uh, large numbers of singleton selects, high volume of single row inserts, row by row processing is obviously never a good idea in SQL environments. Don't try to do that here either. We do not do XML, we do have support for JSON now which is, I think, of interest. Um, just, okay, so hopefully this kind of lays the groundwork. So let's get to some more of the interesting stuff here. If you have one of these migrations, you have a, let's say, a, a, a Teradata system or something that you want to move to the cloud and you're looking at Azure Data Warehouse, 
there's a f the, the two main approaches that I've seen are you can do a sort of a phased approach or you can do the full migration. And there's pros and cons to each. My preference, if I'm going to be working with someone on these, is to always do more of a phased approach. Because they're so complex and because of the technical debt, this gives you the ability to sit down, reanalyze, and, and make sure that what's there is what's really required. And then you can move sort of one module at a time. So if you think of like the Kimball star schema, uh, think of like a uh, domain within Kimball as being maybe one thing that you want to move. So you're going to say, OK, purchasing, this is your mart. Let's pick that up and move it. And then we'll get to the other stuff. It can take a long time from end to end, but you get things out there into the cloud sooner, and you can start getting uh, value. We talked about value and price performance earlier. You can get to that point sooner, whereas the other approach is sort of a full migration. It's more of a lift and shift. You're going to take everything as is, pick it up, move it to the cloud, and drop it off. And you're going to have to do a bunch of automation and conversion along the way. It's going to take longer to get through that, but once you're through it, everything's out there. Then you can focus on trying to tighten things up and re-architect it if you need to. Um, while I prefer the first, a lot of times the business needs mandate the second because they have to get off their appliance before their licensing runs out in X amount of time. Uh, we've seen a lot of, especially with like Natiza, no longer really being supported by IBM. We've had a lot of Natiza migrations that we've worked with with different customers trying to get them off the appliance before they lost support. And then one thing that applies to both. OK, so uh, on, the phased, uh, on the full migration, actually two things to highlight. On the phased approach, I do recommend starting with your simplest workload. That allows you to do some learnings on your easier use cases before you get to some of the more complex stuff. I think that's a really key thing to keep in mind. Uh, if you can't, you're doing a full migration. Running both systems side by side for a period of time is usually a good idea. That way you can cut back if you need to. Two things I think are key. And then whether you do either one, you, if you can start with a pilot project just to flush out any complications or call it a POC, whatever you want, this is key. Because every migration, if you're going from you know, Teradata, DB2, whatever it is you're moving from into, you're going to want to learn what are the difficulties, where are we going to expect to run into issues? And then when you start doing your full mi migration plan, you'll know where you want to focus. So those, those projects um, can be really helpful for, for defining exactly where your problem areas are going to be. So I'm going to hand it over to Elizabeth here for a little bit. And she's going to talk a little bit about the um, you know, breaking down the uh, different architectures. So yeah, uh, this section we're going to talk about some of the architecture patterns and also some best practices as well. So to basically start with, I'm going to go through two concepts that you might be familiar with. But uh, the first one is the traditional data warehouse. And so this is um, a warehouse. Um, flow where you have your data coming in and you have uh, your ETL pipeline, which will transform the data and then land it into your databases. And what I want to emphasize in this pattern is that you have, um, when you start or when you create this kind of data warehouse, you have spent a lot of time up front deciding what requirements you're looking to fulfill. And you spent a lot of time in the conceptual phase, in the requirements phase, and then you build out this data warehouse. So it's very uh, much about answering specific business questions beforehand. And it has a more um, simple but uh, rigid end-to-end -end workflow. Uh, and I want to then contrast it with another concept, which uh, you hear a lot about, is the data lake. And so in a data lake, you um, usually this means it's a repository for storing large amounts of data, but also it stores different kinds of formatted data. So unstructured data, semi-structured data, um, you know, things from many different sources, such as IoT, um, machine-generated data, um, emails, tweets, as well as you know, line of business application data, your sales or um, inventory data as well. And then they all can be uh, landed in a data lake. And then once it's there, 
you will have the option to plug in a lot of different data lake processing engines on top of that. And in this concept, you, you basically you land all of your data first, and then you uh, get your insight from the data afterwards. And you spend less time in the initial setup phase. You, uh, you know there's some business value in that data, but you don't know exactly what value that is when you first start creating your data lake. And this slide talks more about the differences between the traditional data warehouse and a data lake. So uh, like I mentioned, in a data lake, it has more flexibility. It's easier for you to uh, write the data, but there's going to be more effort on actually reading the data. So if you see at the bottom, what we often refer to this as like a schema on read. So when you actually do connect it to an analytics engine, you're going to have to spend more time uh, making sure that that data has the right um, schema and can work well with whatever analytics engine you're using. And in comparison, the data warehouse pattern, you have spent a lot of time at the beginning cleansing the data and transforming it into some very standard and reliable format. And it's very well suited to some process that you have already um, defined well beforehand. And so it's very good for like an operational sort of workflow. But so you put more effort into it uh, when you're writing it, but then getting the data out is much easier because it has this uh, well defined schema. Now, taking those two concepts, we are going to uh, talk about this new architecture, the modern data warehouse architecture on Azure because it lets you get the benefits of both the traditional data warehouse and the data lake, because there are, uh, we're not saying one is better than the other. There are use cases that benefit one more, uh, benefit one for one scenario and another for another scenario. So now, you, instead of having to choose or replicate data, you can ingest your data from all the different sources and use tools like Azure Data Factory and land the data in your data lake storage account. And then from there, you can still use the data in a data warehouse using Azure Synapse Analytics on top of that. But now that your data is in one place, you have, um, you have broken down some of the barriers or different silos that you might have had before. And you can give um, your, your business new opportunities to get insight from the data, like by connecting to Azure Databricks for you know, more analytics insights using Spark and other tools like that. And you get the, the flexibility of storing your data and also the opportunity to uh, still have that very well-defined um, structure in a data warehouse when you're using Synapse Analytics on top of that data. Oh, and since, uh, like Shane mentioned, we have the um, expertise in the data lake and the Synapse Analytics components, we're going to talk a little bit more about the details of those two services. So Azure Data Lake Storage Gen 2 was uh, made generally available earlier this year. And what's exciting about Gen 2 is that it's built on top, it's like a feature of um, Azure Blob Storage. And what we had seen before is that we had Blob Storage, which has a lot of great cost and scale um, you know, features, and it had a lot of uh, management features. And then we had ADLS Gen 1, which had um, you know, unlimited file size and hierarchical file system, but it didn't quite have the same um, scale price or the cost price point. And now with Gen 2, we brought the both of both, uh, best of both worlds into um, one service. So you get a, a true hierarchical file system, and that's speaking to the point at the bottom about being fast. So in a lot of analytic workloads, especially if they're built on HDFS compliant um, applications, they assume that you can rename a directory and it'd be an atomic operation. Well, if you're using a flat namespace, like an object storage um, account, you actually don't have a true folder or directory object. And when you're renaming that directory, you're actually having to rename every object underneath that directory. And at the big data scale, you might have millions of objects under there. And so what some uh, open source tool might think is you know, very a fast operation will actually 
take you know, a significant amount of time. But if you landed your data in Gen 2, you will actually see that you can rename a directory with you know, tens of millions of files, and it's really just an atomic operation to rename that directory. And there's a, a, a great um, rich set of features under lifecycle management of your data. So as your use cases change for a data set, you can start moving it down to a cooler tier, like the archive tier. Um, if you have data that you need to access a lot and you want you know, good performance, you can use the hot tier. And so with data like storage Gen 2, you have all of those features also available. And security is you know, on top of everyone's mind. And with the cloud, you can have um, Azure uh, features to meet your security requirements. And then you can focus on writing your business logic and application logic. Because we have you know, encryption and ACL, so access control lists. And since we have this hierarchical file system, you have access control lists on directories and files. And you can make sure that each user has access to only the data that they actually need to access. Um, scalable, so you, you might have what you think is a, not a large data set today, but you want to be able to um, meet requirements in the future as your data sets grow, um, as you see benefits in new data. Um, and then integration ready, this is a storage system that is the underpinning for all of the analytics engines on top of Azure. So you can connect it to Databricks and HDI and Synapse and, um, and get the insights from the data with many different engines that can be based on what your developer is most comfortable with or what kind of use case you have. OK, I think this is another oh, transition. Yeah. yeah. OK. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So. Um, most of this talk will be based, uh, when we refer to Azure Synapse Analytics, is going to be focused on what's formerly been known as SQL Data Warehouse. So we'll talk a little bit in a second about the, um, some of the new capabilities that are coming. Um, so here I'm just talking specifically about the value prop for DW in the sense that um, it brings you this ability to scale up and down. We have this flexibility, which is, um, I would say, the I would argue that the most secure MPP cloud platform out there, and we've got some benchmarks on that, but there's a lot of um, really cool things we can do from a security standpoint with encryption at rest, with the uh, um, tying into Azure Active Directory and um, role-level security, different things. And uh, the fl flexibility of workload management and concurrency, we've got some really cool things with workload management that are coming beyond the sort of standard concurrency slots, et cetera, that you've seen in the past. And I think that might have come out this week. I should probably double check on that. But anywho, um, let me move on and talk a little bit about the Azure Sy Synapse Analytics piece. I'm just going to spend a little bit of time on this, but, but real quick, who uh, did everyone or some of you get a chance to go to the Azure Synapse session that was presented earlier. Okay, we've got a few. Are we all aware of Azure Synapse? By a show of hands? You heard of it? <laughs> okay. Uh, this, I think, kind of paints the whole picture. Um, so just real quick, for those of you that didn't get to go to that session, what we're doing, uh, this is preview right now. You can, there's a site you can go to to register for the preview if you want to try to try it out for pilot projects or what have you. Um, we're creating essentially a workspace where you can drive your orchestration pipelines. Um, you can, we have a Spark engine that you can spin up to interact with your data lake. Um, we have the SQL Data Warehouse product essentially inside of it. The messaging is that it's an evolution of SQL Data Warehouse. Um, but the, but you know, uh, as a as a user, you're going to have a workspace with a single portal experience where you can go and you can interact with all these various services, um, which is, uh, I think, going to be really interesting. It's going to have like notebook capabilities. So you see here the different languages that you can work with. You'll be able to drive your Spark jobs and clusters and different things through the, uh, the workbook capability there. Now, you're still going to have your port 1433. You can interact with it on SSMS and do all the things you do right now in SQL DW. But 
this really ties together the things that Elizabeth was just talking about in terms of the modern data warehouse, modern data warehouse architecture because you'll be able to work with your structured and unstructured data. Some of those barriers I talked about earlier go away to an extent because you're not sort of pigeonholed by using certain tools for certain things. We're tightening the integration here to uh, allow you to work through any of your analytical use cases. Uh, and so, yeah, this is preview. I think it's pretty exciting. I think it's gonna be, make a huge difference. And, um, should also cut down on, on confusion where we've heard from some customers that sometimes they don't know where to start with what tool for what job. Uh, so this should, should take away some of that. Um, we can, we'll have an FAQ at the end. If you do have questions about this or it's not clear, we wanna make sure that uh, everyone kind of understands where we're going. Um, SQL DW, like the code base of what you have today in GA is gonna continue. It's, there's no issues there. It's evolving into this to include uh, integration points with these other things, and it's going to be known as Azure Synapse Analytics. Make sense? Everyone good? Okay. Okay, then I'm going to move on. Um, maybe I should ask quickly, is everyone familiar with SQL DW as a service in terms of what, it, what, what the sort of standard capability of it is for MPP? Are there some questions? Uh, I see some maybe that aren't so sure. Let me just spend a little bit of time on that. So SQL Data Warehouse is essentially a, um, an MPP technology that's in the cloud. So think of like APS or Teradata or one of these products where you have uh, distributed storage and multiple worker nodes. Um, if I was going to connect to a SQL Data Warehouse, I'm going to connect through what we call the control node. It's kind of like the head node in SQL in uh, Hadoop, or the name node. It's going to distribute your jobs across the compute nodes, figure out whatever needs to be done, and then send the answer back to the user. That's really the gist of what it does. There's a lot more to it, um, but just so we kind of are on the, on the same playing field. So that's why if you have one of these EDWs running on an MPP appliance, whether it's Exadata or whatever else, you can pick that up, move it to the cloud, and get similar capability, uh, plus the ability to scale up and down, et cetera. All right, I'm going to move on. Uh, and then if there's questions on that later, we can circle back. We're going to start getting into some of the, the use cases and some of the customer stories. I'm going to talk through a little about the migration uh, path that you might follow if you were going to uh, perform one of these migrations. <clears throat> so let's assume for the case, for this um, process that you, ha uh, you have an appliance that you're working with. So some sort of on-premise enterprise data warehouse running on an MPP appliance. There's a few things that you're going to need to do to get that to the cloud. The first thing, uh, let's take these two paths in parallel. So one of the paths is going to be exporting your metadata which is going to include your tables, stored procedures, code running on top of that appliance, or um, you know, views, that type of thing. We need to get that out and convert that so that we can run it in Azure SQL DW. I'm assuming that's your target because you're in the session. Uh, the other thing is gonna be moving the, uh, the data, which you know, we could be talking about hundreds of terabytes of data that needs to get moved from one to the other, possibly petabytes. Uh, and so that's gonna take a different methodology, a different strategy to get that through. So um, let's walk through these paths a little bit and some of the things you want to think about as you're approaching this. Now, we'll start with the metadata, which is sort of the top path. The blue line is what we recommend you try to automate if you can. And then the green line is gonna be something that's more manually that uh, requires more manual work. The, for the most part, if you're looking at views and table metadata, that more or less can be automated. Most of these appliances or uh, EDW environments are going to support some level of ANSI SQL. So it's not too difficult to take one create table statement and move it to some, something else that can be run on a SQL DW. But that's pretty easy to automate. Views are a little more difficult, but Generally speaking, you can get those done as well. Where you really run into issues are when you start doing like application code or stored procedure code. 
because there's usually a lot more logic there. Um, with Teradata, you've got the BTEC uh, capability that is very, very challenging, well, more challenging to convert. So there's a lot of things that you can run into that aren't easy. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about what your choices are for those scenarios for automating. Um, but though, I guess the, the default method, if you don't have a, a way to do an automated conversion, is to do these manually. Um, but like again, there are options there. So we'll talk about that in a minute. The bottom path is where you're doing your, your data export. Um, and let's just assume for this, the sake of importing it into SQL Data Warehouse, you're going to use uh, Polybase, which means you're going to export flat files, move the flat files to the data lake, and then use Polybase to ingest from there. And why do we, why do we suggest that? You could take, let's say, Azure Data Factory and say, OK, here's Exadata or whatever your source is. Let's do our historical migration and point that to data warehouse and just have it move data over the wire. But if you've got hundreds of terabytes of data, that may not be the best path. Uh, and if you do just like a uh, straight file export to a local directory and then use something like AZ copy or we have some other uh, tools that we'll talk about in a minute, um, you, you want to uh, think of it in, in phases. So the first part is getting the data out of your local system. So do that as quickly as possible. Do the transfer of data as quickly or most as efficiently as possible to the data lake. And then from there, you want to efficiently pull it into your warehouse instead of streaming everything all at once, uh, once one shot. Uh, and we found that generally you get better performance by approaching it that way. Um, and the reason, just as an aside, the reason Polybase is so quick for pulling data in from the data lake is because, uh, remember, it's an MPP technology. So if I have 10 worker nodes in my data warehouse, those 10 worker nodes can reach out to storage and have 10 readers, actually more than that per worker node. But you get the idea. We're, we're, we're um, dividing the work across 10 nodes to pull that data in. Uh, and because Data Lake is a um, distributed file system, it essentially assigns the various nodes to, uh, to increase your total throughput. We can circle back on that too if there's, if there's questions. Hopefully that makes sense though. Um, and uh, though these are the two major paths that we want to focus on, let's add a little bit more. Um, once you have the conversion, then you can take your scripts and, and create your tables, staging tables in your environment. So when your data is prepped and ready, then you can do that ingestion that I was just talking about. Um, and then the last thing is after your data is there, you can get your, your converted stored procedures out there and you can test your stored procedures. So it's kind of a simplified version of what needs to be done. But if you haven't done that and you're starting to think about how are we going to get this system over here to the cloud? These are, this is kind of a high-level view of the steps you, you're going to want to follow to get to that point. Okay. Uh, we'll want to uh, go into the details if you have um, questions about this at some point. Yeah, go ahead. This part, especially uh, being able to transfer the data, uh, mm -hmm. I think that uh, could be relatively easy, easily solved. I think uh, one of the challenges are, uh, in my environment specifically, is the large number of EPL type of jobs that, that I have running on all sorts of areas that are not even necessarily part of the data warehouse, mm -hmm. that are in ancillary systems, that one way or another, on downstream do end up in, in the data warehouse. So the, the, I guess the question is, those, those CPL jobs are consumed by the business in different stages, sometimes before you get to the data warehouse. And as you're doing the migration into, um, uh, into the cloud, how can you help in migrating those jobs that manage, massage, yep. clean, and provide data at different stages to the business Mm -hmm. When you also use all the all the products other than SSIS, I have SSIS, Clover, and you know whatnot. Sure. 
So in a nutshell, the question is, I have all these complicated jobs running in my current system. How do I migrate those with everything else so that, that we don't lose any, um, we don't miss our SLAs with the customer and we can do our you know, eventual cutover? Um, so that is certainly uh, something that can be a challenge. And I think it goes back to what I mentioned about are we doing a phased approach or like a whole lift and shift? Mm -hmm. Let's just assume for that you're, gonna, you're doing a lift and shift environment where you're going to pick everything up and move it. That is, um, I think, maybe simplified to some extent if you're running SSIS, because you can run those in on SSIS, SSIS runtime in Azure Data Factory. And, make, and, and I'm assuming in this case, the endpoints are going to be there from pointing you from one service to the next. So when you move it to the other environment, after you know, getting everything converted over, you should be able to move those jobs and have them doing the same work. Now, if you're going to go through the effort of re, you see what I mean? You, you, you shouldn't have to modify each one, you just have to change the connectors. Now, if you're gonna do it a phased approach, then you would be evaluating and, and potentially updating them as you go, so it's less of a concern, and you could do it case by case for specific domains. Um, hopefully that gives you some clarity. It really is, at that point, it's very dependent on what you're using for those integration jobs. Yeah. What sort of turnaround time do you give to your customers in that lift and shift phase approach that they come back online and they schedule maintenance and everything there? Because you're going to have an interruption with that lift and shift. Yes. Um, now, if you run them side by side, you're going to keep your other uh, implementation on until the, the new one's ready, right? So uh, for example, um, one of the recent customers says, and we'll, we'll continue after this question, but after, um, uh, so I, we have a customer that spent X number of months building um, a new platform. They picked everything up, moved it over, and they, they did this like a soft go live, and then they had the cloud version and the on-prem version running for say a month until they proved that the new one uh, validates against the, the old system and eventually they felt comfortable turning it off. So that sort of insulates you from that and then you don't have that sort of um, immediate pain. So there's strategies you can use to get to that point. Um, one thing that will be, one of the big challenges is if you're moving that much data, it's gonna take a fair amount of time. So by the time you move the historical load, then you gotta catch up on your incrementals. So there's gonna be some potential, potential gap there. But hopefully you're going to do that before you would be actually doing your cutover so that the data sets are already in sync at that point, if that makes sense. Okay. All right, I'm gonna jump ahead. We've got some other things to chat about here. Oh, the last thing was client connectivity. Actually, you probably wanna start with that one, but anyway, we'll continue. Um, I'm going to just cover a couple other sort of basic things you want to make sure you do in Data Warehouse, some things that you want to do in these migrations, and then um, uh, Elizabeth is going to talk a little bit more about the, the actual data movement portion because we do have some cool things you can do there. Um, so with DW, I don't know why, but for one reason or another, a lot of people get this wrong. Um, the table designs are, are very, very important. You have to have the distributions right, or you're just going to get miserable performance. The default is round robin. And essentially what that means, so in Data Warehouse, you have 60 different distributions. Think of a distribution as like a file group. You've got 60 file groups, essentially, for each table. And round robin is going to go to each one and just put a little bit of data on each one. So then when you join it to another big fact table that's round robin, it has to shuffle both tables so that the join column is co-located on those distributions before it can actually resolve the data set. What you want to have happen is have a hash alignment so that if you have fact table A and fact table B and you're joining on a customer column, they're already distributed on that customer column, so you don't have to do that shuffle. That's very expensive for very large tables. The other thing you can do is make sure that you're, if you're talking like classic Kimball methodology, if you have dimension tables that they're being replicated, especially the smaller ones, the rule of thumb is less than two gigabytes. 
it's a guideline. You can break that if you, if you need to. But by making sure that, that the certain frequently used reference tables are replicated and joined to the fact distributed fact, fact tables, that will also avoid data movement. You're never going to completely eliminate data movement, but if you can minimize it, it's going to give you much, much better overall performance. Now, along with that, um, you want to pay, pay attention to your indexing. So the three columns on the left are sort of the primary index, so this controls how the tables are stored on disk. And the one on the right are your non-clustered secondary indexes, which is a GA feature we added, I think we, I don't know, uh, probably about a year ago. Uh, the default, uh, what's the default in SQL Server? If you don't specify, it's a heap. That is not the case here. The default in SQL DW is a clustered column store index. So if I have, um, let's say I'm creating a control table for my data integration project. So every time I pull some data, I'm going to log a row to my uh, control table. Uh, if that's a replicated table, or I'm sorry, if it's a cluster column store index, uh, every time I write data to that, it's going to go to the delta store and eventually get pushed to the, um, the compressed data set. Uh, that is um, going to potentially lead to poor performance and can cause some, potentially some, I guess it wouldn't cause locking issues in this case. But anyway, cluster comps or indexes aren't really efficient unless you have very, very large tables. Um, so for your smaller dimension tables and your, um, you know, any reference tables, you want to, to avoid that and make sure that you're using uh, either a clustered index or a heap. For your big, big fact tables, that's obviously that's the, the choice you want. Um, so any, anyway, uh, one last note here. Uh, typically, you would avoid heaps. Here, we actually get a nice performance benefit when we're pushing data onto the service by using a heap. So uh, I do use, recommend using heap for your staging tables when you're ingesting data. I think I'm running long, so I'm going to move along here, and then uh, we'll circle back to other questions. Um, I mentioned we were going to talk about code conversion options. This is actually really critical for these types of migrations. Um, obviously, manual conversion is going to be slow. You could be talking about, I don't know, tens of thousands of lines of stored procedure code. Um, you want to avoid that if you can. We have customers that will go that path because they don't want to pay a partner or whoever to do it, but it, it, it's going to take time. There are um, automated conversion options. You can potentially build your own. You're basically building a code parser. And if you know the differences between the syntax, it can be definitely be done. Um, internally, we have, keep it in my mic. Uh, internally, we have a um, process that can do some of this. Uh, it's, I think, eventually going to be open sourced. Um, if you are interested in that, usually you can go through your account teams and eventually get to the person that does that. But it's not like a sanctioned thing. It's just something we do to assist here and there. Um, there are a lot of options uh, if you go third party to buy, to um, do either um, full code conversions. And there's actually API translation layers out there as well. The way that would work is here's all your, all your client tools. They are used to hitting your local appliance. You would insert this API translation layer in between and then have your SQL data warehouse stuff on the back end. Your client tools will then hit this API translation layer, and then it would query DW and then return the results. So it would require uh, very little conversion in terms of your code modifications. It can cut your, your migration down from, you know, I don't know, 12 months to like three months because you don't have to convert all that client code or anything. It'll just automatically work with the new environment. Um, and we have customers that have used that. Li there's a lot of licensing on those um, in you know, some cases. But uh, it's an option just so that you're aware of it. So I highly recommend looking at code conversion if you can. Um, automated code conversion because it can take a lot of time out of these projects. Usually these tend to be quite long running and that's one of the biggest challenges. 
Uh, and then just a quick shout out here on a new feature that we actually is in public preview now. If you use the Azure SQL Data Warehouse, typically we would adjust with Polybase. Um, I mentioned Polybase earlier. The copy command actually takes a lot of the pain out of ingesting data files. And I'll show a demo of that here at the end if we have time. But I'm taking too long, so hopefully, <laughs> <laughs> hopefully we'll get there. I'm sure we will. OK, I'm going to turn it back over to Liz Liz sure. to talk about specifics, uh, right. migrations. So the next few slides, we're going to talk about the tools available for migrating the bulk of your data at the start of your migration um, process. And then we'll also talk about some best practices as well. So the first thing you need to do is uh, take an inventory of your data sets, find out what the volumes of data you're looking to migrate are, um, your schedule constraints. And also, it's important to understand what your bandwidth constraints are from your on-premise um, data warehouse to Azure. Because based on those, you can pick one of these uh, two options, or the two most commonly used options. Um, the first one is Azure Data Factory. So this is a service that you can use to create a pipeline and move data from many different types of sources and sinks, including your local server to ADLS. And it's especially useful if you have something um, called Express Route from your on-premise data warehouse, because that is a reliable, uh, fast, private connection to Azure. So for example, right, so you should definitely consider Data Factory if you have Express Route um, and if you had a 100 terabyte data set using a one GBPS um, network, then it would take around 10 days to replicate that data or to uh, copy that data. And it's also a good tool to use if you want to have some flexibility on the schedule of your data migration. If, for example, if you're doing a phased approach where you want to try with one smaller data set first and then ramp up as you see the, how the progress is going, this gives you that flexibility to manage how um, quickly you're, you're going to migrate to Azure. But there's also another great service called Azure Databox. And Databox has many form factors, but one of them is basically it's a, a piece of hardware that they will ship to you. And one of them has 80 terabytes of useful capacity. And it's in a you know, very rugged device that has a lot of um, very strong security features and encryption on it so that your data is safe while it's being transported. And it's a very useful tool if you have large data sets. So generally recommend if you have more than 50 terabytes of data to look at Databox. And it's very useful if you have data centers that don't have Express Route or have a slow bandwidth connection um, or an unreliable network. And so for those lift and shift ones, this would be very helpful for you to minimize how much time it would take for you to, to do that first initial bulk copy to Azure. And I think generally the first, um, you know, the first ordering of a data box will give you a 10 day turnaround time from when you receive the data box and then you ship it back to Azure. And I also um, noted that it's good for customers who may have sensitive data and don't want to actually transfer it um, over a network connection as well. So I'm going to go through a couple of customer uh, examples that, that use these two different approaches in um, a few slides. But before we get to those, I have some slides about how you should think beforehand of how you want your data to land in data lakes. Because uh, as you start collecting data from dis disparate sources and the size of the data starts growing, it becomes very important that you think ahead of time of how you want to organize your data. And this slide talks about uh, one good practice is to have kind of three different categories of data. And we also have examples of how if you are running a platform on Data Lake, how you'd use these, or if you're running a business directly. But they all have a raw data uh, folder, which is where you want all of your, your source data that's like your source of truth has you know, no um, transformations. It's basically what your uploaders wrote to the Data Lake. And then after that, you could have some uh, cooking jobs that takes this raw data. Maybe it you know, takes out some you know, identifiable information or makes a data set available for uh, non-production use in what we would call a staged data folder. 
And this would be great for developers, um, any non-production services, to start using that data in the data lake. And then after that, you can have another location for your production data. So as you might imagine, you know, these are things that your business relies on for operations. So you want it to be restricted you know, to only those users who absolutely need to have access to that production database. So with these different directories, you can provide all the different uh, personas access to the data and control who gets to see what, but also give them enough access that they can start experimentation and, and get insights from the data that may have been harder to get um, in a more traditional data warehouse. And also, it's good to use your top-level directories to have um, the names be associated with what kind of data you are actually storing. So you would say like a raw and then event logs or some other describe, describable name at the top of the directory. And then after that, go down into a year, month, day format. This makes it easier to control access to data sets, but also give you a good way for your analytics engines to just get the data for a certain time period that you're going to do your analysis over. And then you might want to ask yourself, do I want to use one data lake store account or multiple data lake store accounts? Well, one benefit of um, the data lake store is that it scales um, to large data sets. So really, this decision is, is uh, going to be a billing kind of um, decision because you uh, an, an account can be associated with an Azure subscription, and that could be uh, the way you control your uh, your team's bills or how you account for how much um, each team is using on Azure. So for you might use a single account if you want to have a a. Uh, a place where you can have data for all of your teams, but you can still organize it into different file systems or containers. And then within each department, you can have their different raw stage and production data. And you can control access all the way down to the file folder level. So even though you have all the data in one account, it's still you're able to secure who can access which data. But all of that will be rolled up to this um, one subscription. And then you'd have to cost out um, how you distribute you know, the resources to each of the departments. Uh, alternatively, you could go to multiple accounts and you could have each department have a separate bill, but the downside here is that you'd have to attach it to multiple, or you'd have, if you have like an engine like HD Insight, you'd have to attach multiple storage accounts to that analytics engine. So that's more overhead than um, is required, but if you have some requirements around billing, that might be um, beneficial. Okay, so the next slide, I'm going to go through a story of a major financial services company that went through one of these uh, data warehouse migrations. What they had on premise was around 100 terabytes in an Oracle system. And their use case or their trigger for migration to the crowd cloud was very interesting. I, um, they had an on-premise data warehouse that had lots of interest and activity, and they just cannot meet the demands for this data. They had to start restricting who can access this data, and they knew as a company this was not the direction they wanted to go. So they w had this strategy in their company to democratize the data. So they wanted to let any, you know, anyone who had some um, you know, a hypothesis or some uh, experiment they wanted to run in the data, have access to the data, and potentially get new business value out of it. But they also had to balance this with still running a production data warehouse workload on top of it as well. So they looked towards the cloud to be able to scale and meet these two needs. And to get into the details of how the migration went for their metadata conversion part, they used this automated code conversion that Shane talked about. It's the one uh, that right now is an internal tool, so they sent their um, scripts and we sent them back the, uh, the code after it was converted. And then due to the fact that they had a large data set of around 100 terabytes, they decided to use Azure Databox. And the other reason why this was a good option was they had a very limited bandwidth from on-prem to Azure. 
So what that would look like in this uh, little graphic is they would receive the Azure Data Box on prem. They would uh, connect it to their data warehouses, copy the, the data, and then they would ship it. I think a mailing label, ma mailing label comes printed on it already. Ship it back into an Azure Data Center, and then someone in Azure receives the data box and then copies it into the customer's data lake account. And then once that bulk data movement has happened, you probably have some recent data that needs to be also replicated. So what they chose is um, ADF because it has support for replicating incremental changes so that they can continuously keep up with the new data that's landing on premise. Oh yeah. Okay, yeah, I think they definitely did it within the 10 days. Yeah, um, but I don't have the exact date. Um, I was talking to one of my teammates about this, and it sounds like uh, when they ordered it, I think they received the box the next day. Mm -hmm. They attached it to their network and then did what they did. And when it got back, I think it took... Um, it was the next day that it was available within Azure. Yeah. Um, does it automatically get loaded into a data lake, or does it just show up as like a separate blade that's like data box, and then you got copied over to data lake? There, yeah. yeah. So you would set up when you order it. Essentially, you would tell it where you want it to go once it's loaded. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, so you you have a data lake configured. Fine. Yeah. Hey, hey, I want you guys to load this into my data lake. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think they have a bunch of tamper-proof features on it and encryption, and that's one of their major focus points there is to protect the data while it's in transfer. Um, but I don't, I don't have any specific details, but I do know that's, that's one of their targeted scenarios. Yeah, I know um, beyond that, I, I know that um, it gets shipped in a crate or something, and then when you get it, like that has the box and the mailing information to send it back. So. Uh, I think it's pretty tight and logistically in how that's handled, um, but I, I don't know speci the specifics about those security features. Yeah, but I, I'm pretty sure they talk a lot about it on the documentation as well. Yeah. So I think yeah, you'll be able to find some. One quick question yeah. on um, base approach. I, I would I would guess that. Um, Typical processes are still supported. Like they, I already have transactional replication configured. I can do from on-prem to the data lake directly, load ship, those kind of services. Because uh, we haven't uh, discussed that. I'm assuming that it's expected, right? Those, those features are there. Say that again. The ability for me to continue to use uh, transactional replication, for example, from my oh. on-prem environment into the data lake. Um. I can replicate the data. So SQL DW doesn't have replication per se. You would need to set something up, like Attunity will work, exactly. um, something like that. that. Okay, then Attunity will work with Data Warehouse, so that's an option. Directly yeah. into the Data Warehouse or directly yeah. into uh, uh, SQL Azure instance and then the Data Warehouse. Will They've got a, um, a product that works with Data Warehouse. Um, I haven't played with it too much, but I know that it's Pretty there. Good. Okay. Yeah. Good. Mm -hmm. I recommend uh, flat file format when reading that data out of something like Oracle to load it in. Was it just is it straight CSV or Parquet or? I would say Parquet going forward. Um, it's the format that we seem to be adding more support for. One of our other Ignite announcements was a direct Parquet reader. I don't know if you saw that or not. Um, but that uh, will allow you to query Parquet files within the data lake, um, not quite at the level that it would be if it was in the engine, but uh, at a pretty fast rate. So um, that allows you to do some data exploration if you want to directly on the files, and then um, do your loads, I guess, from there. I guess on that question, does the Spark engine and the SQL engine allow you to do directly 
query those at the same time? Ah. Um, uh, so in the future state where we have like the on-demand SQL engine and the Spark engine, yeah, you should be. It'd be like uh, running in multiple services over any over the data lake, yeah. right? So yeah, you'd be able to read with multiple yeah. readers. Yes, yes. Yep. But even in the current world, um, the uh, the direct parquet reader is in the current version of SQL DW uh, as a as a public preview now, so you you can get access to that. I would going yeah going forward um, we're gonna you know probably continue to enhance that capability. So Parquet is I think our our uh, preferred choice now with Polybase. I think you're better off always with delimited files, uh, just because it can split them up and ingest them. Uh, but then there's also the copy feature, wh which will allow you to have multiple readers on top of the Parquet files for just pure ingestion. So um, things are changing a little bit. Let's try I that. like Parquet because you get the schema as well, right? In the data lake uh, path for design of the data lake, uh, do you need to introduce something like version 1, version 2? Because in several sessions I kind of uh, suggested because it can be schema changed and your files as well keep much information in the same place as the current schema right now. Or need to kind of you know, interpret them in the current schema. So in the design of data lake somewhere like on the instance of the entity and sales data, I don't have any guidance on this part. How about you? So, so you mean, like, what do you, what are you saying exactly? Data lake design. Yeah. When you're kind of, you know, talking like about the, the directories the within the yeah. yeah. Directory yeah. Do you need to insert someone like V1 version one of the data, V2 kind of create version on the level of the kind of path? You know? mm -hmm. So, if you're uploading multiple versions of the files, you mean? Assuming that the schema can change with the time. Oh, I see, for like schema drift. Can we park this something. question maybe? So because I think we're going to try to get through the other slides. Oh, yeah, but that's a good question, yeah. Sure, sure. I'll write we can it stay, down. We can stay afterwards, yeah. Um, so this slide talks about what their, um, this financial services company, what their architecture looked like once they were in uh, Azure. One thing to point out is that they could then start using Databricks. They were running some, I think, uh, ML models on top of this data, which is one of the the use cases they had for moving to Azure as well. Uh, they had um, a quick migration with Azure Databox, but one thing they thought could have gone better is when they, the Databox was received, they didn't actually specify who was supposed to be loading the data, so they had to scramble around and find someone who was available to copy the data. And you have this very tight window, so you need to make sure some of those logistics are ironed out. So the second customer story is about uh, multinational beverage company. They had a smaller amount of data on-prem, but this could be just like the start of a phased migration for this company. But the main thing they wanted to do was decommission some on-prem Teradata to reduce their costs. And along those lines of also reducing costs, they decided to do a manual conversion of all of their metadata and also use Azure Data Factory as the migration tool, because it's also a lower cost option compared to Databox. And they migrated, yeah, the bulk of the migration was done using ADF, and then they also used uh, ADF for the incremental change as well. And after the migration, this is what their, the pattern looked like. So they also had the Synapse Analytics, you know, working on top of, top of store, but they also had it connected to the Azure analysis services for more um, insight into the data, more reports, and also generating the Power BI dashboards on top of that. Uh, they were you know, happy with the, the cost of uh, the migration in terms of uh, doing their own code conversion and the ADF data transfer also worked with their migration requirements. They did have an issue with uh, the Polybase because they had compressed files and when they were uploading it, they, um, the way the Polybase process worked was it was not able to 
parallelize the um, ingestion because it was compressed. So to actually get the best performance, what they needed to do was go in and change the loading to actually uh, load in multiple of these compressed files at the same time and to get performance. Because using you know, the default options, they weren't getting the best performance they could have gotten out of uh, Polybase and Azure Synapse. Uh, I think, okay, now we can move on to the demo. So, oh. Yeah. All right. We're good. Cool. All right. So what I want to show, I just um, want to show one of the new features within um, now Azure Synapse Analytics. You may have seen the announcement on this. Uh, they can't see it. Uh, let me switch this real quick. I think this is cool capability. And cross your fingers. <laughs> Works correctly here. Uh, so if you, can you see okay? I can zoom in if, uh, if not. Is it good? Yeah. Okay. Um, so if you're familiar with Polybase, you're familiar with the struggle of creating all the various things that you need in order to get it to work. <laughs> so the first thing you would need to do is create the external file format. So the file format I'm ingesting, okay, thank you, uh, is pipe delimited file. That exists, uh, so I'm not going to run this, but I wanted you to see everything you would have to go through, and if it doesn't work, it takes some time to fiddle around with it. Uh, after I have the file format, then I need to go ahead and create the data source. So, okay, this is where my files are located. And then finally, I can create the actual table on top of the file using the data source that was just defined. The location here in that storage location, uh, the file format, and then if I want to do anything special with the reject values. Once I have all of this out there, then I can start querying that data set. So this is sitting in, in this case, of course. I think it timed out. Hold on. Am I still highlighting that one? Yeah, so running it on running the polybase query can take a little bit of time because it's essentially what it's doing is it's using a Java bridge. It was originally written to be able to interface with um, with Hadoop HDFS, and it was expanded on and used for Blob Store and, and ADLS and all these different things. So anyway, it's a, it's a Java bridge that's doing all the work, which is why you get really cryptic errors when it doesn't work right, and you have to figure just play around with it to try to figure out what's happening. Okay, so we have 12 million files in the external table. My fact online, wrong button. Fact online sales is currently at uh, 88 million records. It increases every time I run this demo. Uh, so let's run the Polybase version first. And that's gonna take a minute, so we can chat about other things if you want to. <laughs> This is running on uh, Azure Synapse Analytics. This is um, data warehouse, essentially. Okay, so it's the icon on the data warehouse. This one? Oh. It, it's run, I'm running on this database. This will take a little longer. Um, so anyway, while that's running, I'll show you the copy command. So now that we have this copy command functionality, this is all you have to run. It has the path for the file. You give it the field terminator, the format row terminator, et cetera. There's other things that you can pass in if you have like different authentication methods and things like that you have to worry about. But basically, you're looking at a single command. It's written in .NET, so it's a lot faster. And if you get any sort of errors, then it actually makes sense with the errors. Yeah, go ahead. Question, Sita or copy in? Uh, this is a good question. Let me get to that in one second. Let's confirm here we got the records. And when I run my uh, count here, we'll see that we, that jumped up. Now we're over 100 million rows. Let me just start this, and then I'll, I'll talk about your um, question. OK, so the question was CTAS versus copy into. So copy into is strictly for ingestion. So it's bringing file data into the appliant or the database. I still say appliant sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, the 
Polybase will allow you to still do the CTAS. But one thing I've noticed, and maybe you have as well, is that as the data warehouse service evolves, there's more and more features that aren't compatible with partition switching. And normally when you're using CTAS, unless you're doing a full, so this is done, it took half the time to do the copy, which is, I think, nice. Um, so you can see there's some performance enhancements here. But uh, to continue on that path, um, uh, if you're doing a CTAS and then a partition switch, it tends to be the most performant, but something like materialized views, they don't work with uh, partition sw swapping. So you have to drop the materialized view, do your swap, and then rebuild it. Um, you have to disable your non-clustered indexes. If you're using dynamic data masking or something like that, those features don't work well with partition switches. So more and more, we're seeing customers just do, use DML statements, do your inserts and updates. It takes longer, but, but you know, it's a trade-off. You have to kind of make that decision. So you do want to copy into, let's say you did, what is that, 12 million. Um, and if I recall what you said earlier, <clears throat> um, the database on the destination automatically creates the the partitioning and because all mm -hmm. it also includes the um, clustered uh, column stores as well, right? Yeah. So then when you're inserting, does copy into al already breaks it down into like a thousand batches at a time? Or? Yes, I, I don't know the exact methodology it uses to break it down, but it will batch it so you have multiple readers so it can read things in in parallel. This is obviously a small bit data set, and uh, I'm not really scaled up, but it, but if you if you had, let's say, multi-terabyte workloads or f sets of files to ingest, mm -hmm. you could scale your uh, service up so you have more read capability, run your copy commands, whatever you need to do for the ingestion, and then scale back down after your historical load. That's not load. something that I have to uh, worry about. And one of the reasons is because when you do an, and do an inserts into a column store, if you do, uh, I forgot what the number is, I think it's uh, a thousand, or I forget what the number is, if you do less than that, then the rows are not compressed, do not compress until, you know, you reach that threshold. That, uh, and you lose for clustered column store indexes? If I, if I recall correctly. Yeah, you're right. So it's in the, um, let me switch back to the slide. So we're in the FAQ portion now, I believe. Let me just. Um, we had a takeaway slide we can show. Yeah, let me go bit of the yeah. takeaway slide and then we can, we can chat. Take that aside if you like. It's just one of those situations. Um, it's, an important, it's an important topic. Um, so remember that with uh, data, this is actually uh, from a performance perspective is an important thing to note in DW. Um, and I, I, it might be better to get into the specifics after this discussion. Where are we at? We're probably... We have three minutes. Excuse me. Um, three, we got three minutes. Okay. So the, the CCI's row groups max size is like a million, 240,000 records or something like that. Um, you want to be as close to that as you can to maximize your compression and your overall performance. But you have 60 distributions. So in order to get maximum benefit of... Uh, CCIs in your SQL data warehouse, you want to have at least 60 million rows with a, assuming even skew, data skew, to be able to, you know, reach that size. So you get fully compressed CCIs, um, which is, can be a pretty big number, right? So that I, I kind of paid lip service to it earlier when I was mentioning uh, the CCIs with smaller tables isn't necessarily good architecture, and that's the reason, uh, because you don't get great compression that way. Um, Can you copy into a NoSQLite and create the table with the distribution option? Or you'd have to create the table first and then you copy in? You do have to have a destination table. Okay. Yes. I don't believe you can just have it spin one up for you. Generally speaking, yes, because if you if you push it into like a round robin heap, for example, that should give you the highest rate of ingestion speed. It, sh it should be your math. Now, round robin heaps aren't great for downstream performance, so the next step will take a little bit longer. But usually, the 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 biggest bottleneck is getting it into the service. 
if you don't run out of memory. Yeah. Well, so yeah. Usually you're going to use a large resource class or extra large if you can. Do we, uh, let's. I guess do we we should probably go through the takeaways real quick. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. I think they're pretty much. Yeah. Just touching on all the things that we had talked about about before you migrate. Spend time thinking about all of your constraints, uh, network constraints, time, uh, your data set sizes. And if you have lots of data or um, low network bandwidth, consider it as your data box. And yeah, Shane also talked about how you should take advantage of this new copy command. Um, data warehouse best practices. Yeah, so um, definitely get your table structures right. We spent a little bit of time talking about CCIs, distribution strategies, and different things. That's, that's very important, and it's easily overlooked. And a lot of times we'll see customers coming in and say, ah, I know SQL, and they'll just ignore it, and they'll go with the defaults, and then the performance is horrible. Um, you have to pay attention to those details. Um, code conversion, ETL conversion, we talked a little bit about the, the, data, the ETL, but probably not, I probably didn't pay enough attention to it. However, those are probably the biggest categories for the migration in terms of um, you know, overall time and budget. If you can use a third party to do your code conversion or find a way to automate it, you're going to be better off in the long run <laughs> in terms of man, overall man hours. Um, I don't know about costs. I don't, I don't have to pay for those things. So. <laughs> uh, yeah, and reporting tool compatibility. We didn't really talk about that much either, but you know, pretty much everything I've seen can, supports SQL Data Warehouse, so it hasn't been a big issue necessarily. But still good to look at. And then for the daily best practices. Yeah, just uh, think about how to uh, organize your data in a way to have um, everyone have access to the, the right um, data sets, and also how you want to organize accounts based on mainly billing constraints. But um, thank you guys, everyone, for being here on a Friday afternoon. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And thank we can stay around. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.